Okay, it's uh, just gone seven o'clock. So um, I think what we'll do is we'll start and people will continue to join as we go along. Um, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Charlotte McNamara and I am head of the health department at the Kennel Club. I am incredibly pleased um, that Mark Dunning has agreed to be our speaker for this evening. Uh, Mark has a wealth of experience in this area. Um, as head of internal medicine at Specialist Referral Group um, and also as an active member of the vet school team at the University of Not Nottingham. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. I will hand over to you as the expert um, for this evening. I'd like to ask everybody just to keep your microphones on mute if possible, just so that everybody can hear um, as we move through the presentation with Mark. Um, we will take questions at the end thank you to everybody who emailed your questions in advance we'll go through those as a priority first but we will fit as many questions in as possible um, and we can have some discussion at the end with mark so i'll hand over to you great thanks that's, that's great thank you um and thank you for those people that have that have registered i hope it's not too dull boring or full of stuff that you already know um so tonight we're going to go through osteosarcoma really um, the title obviously talks about the background research and guidance. And essentially, it's a, it's a wander through the disease, going through what we sort of know, what we would like to know, and what we're trying to find out. And I and I think we're in a situation with this disease where probably there are more frustrations than than pleasures. Um, so and, and it's quite a, an emotive area, certainly in our experience in talking to owners and breeders of dogs that are affected by it. So what, how's it going to go? So the outline of the talk, so we'll, we'll go through the background of cancer, because I think the thing with any disease that you're trying to understand more about is, or more about how to treat it, is, is understanding the disease itself and, and how the processes work. So you've got to understand how it occurs in order to know how to get in the way of, of, of those processes. So we'll go through that just briefly. We'll talk about why is the disease important? We'll then go through what 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 is this disease to the dogs affected? What are the signs? How do we go about investigating and treating the disease? And then what what are we trying to do to try and improve outcomes? And and I suppose that's the that's the focus, isn't it? That's the point of all of this. But essentially, the outcomes can only improve if we understand more about the disease. And so they're all very much interlinked. And and what does it mean for the future? Well, the future hopefully is that this disease is no longer the scourge of of the big dogs um but that's that you know what we'll come to in the end hopefully so when we're talking about osteosarcoma it, this is a malignant cancer so it is a an overgrowth of cells associated with those that we would normally see in the bones and so if we're talking about cancer what does cancer mean what what is a cancer and so cancer is a a situation where you've got abnormal growth and survival of particular cells, okay, the cancerous cell, i.e. it could be a blood cell, it could be a bone cell, it could be a brain cell. And so why do they become cancerous? Or what is a cancerous cell? What's the properties? And these are the fundamentally important bits. And so cells in the normal situation, in normal life, they do what they're told, they, they act appropriately, and, and they're very nicely and carefully governed, and they just work the ideal is that they work perfectly to, to tune. Cancerous cells, they will develop things such as they will keep growing when they're not being asked to. Cell growth is very carefully contained usually. They will keep dividing. They will make more of themselves without being told. Again, cell division is very carefully, carefully regulated. They won't stop when they're being told to stop, whatever process that might be. They have an ability to generate their own blood supply. As you get bigger, you cannot survive unless you've got oxygen and nutrients, and a blood supply is what you need for that. And they, and this is the big deal, the, they avoid removal by the body. So cancer is a, is a disease process, the same as anything else. The immune system looks at it, decides it doesn't look right, gets rid of it. So their ability to avoid that removal process is, is key. So all of those are features of cancer. And so the, the schematic on the right, there's a, a sort of a stylized picture of how do we get in the way of all that? We've got the little 
mitochondria in the middle of the the screen in the, of the cell where the, these different cell processes occur. We've got a little pink thing on the surface, which is supposed to be where the cell's getting its message from. And then the message is the little orange arrow that's transferring into the nucleus. So it's all of these steps, all of these little bits in these cells that we're trying to interfere with to try and stop them being cancerous. And it's all of these processes that can go wrong, some or all of them. So people talk about the genetics of cancer and genetics is the basis of cancer. But importantly, the environment and genetics are both important in the development of a cancer. And so the same individual will not get cancer in, in, in the same environment, depending on what environmental exposures they have. And so there is a big environmental aspect to the development of cancer. Maybe that's lifestyle. Maybe that's whether you live next to a nuclear power plant or something like that. But anyway, there are environmental aspects that are involved in making those genetics become realized so often what we find is there are multiple steps that have to occur often damage to processes that are occurring inside cells usually the genes before they can become cancerous or malignant as we tend to term it and solid tumors so osteosarcoma being one of those it may be that they need between something like 15 or 25 of these steps so these steps you know things have to keep going for things to occur. Now, they may be very easy steps, but nevertheless, they're multiple steps, which is why these processes are so difficult to get in the way of. There's not just one step in cancers like this where if you turn that one step off, it all it all fixes. Well, but not, not that we know at the minute anyway. And so they are unstable and they will keep going and start to cause problems in the wrong places. And there's a whole thing about the inflammatory response and does inflammation lead to cancer and the inflammation has the ability to change the way cells divide. And so in some of these cases, inflammation can become one of these environmental steps where we get mutation events. This is a normal tissue. So normal tissue is made up of different things. So this is a tissue with normal cells in layers. Now, in a cancerous situation, those normal cells start to change their appearance and they start to divide and they start to divide and divide and they start to drift away from what normal is. We've lost those nice layers, we've lost a nice surface and we're starting to get bulges top and bottom. I cancer often turns into lumps. And what we find with a cancer, not only are they able to keep dividing, but they start to move outside of their normal environment and they start to percolate through. So as you can see, this cancerous process is digging into the normal tissue and it's also digging down and it's moving upwards. So this is the classic situation where the cancer becomes this very poorly contained entity. And that's why they're so difficult to get rid of. And if we look at what happens, cells sit next to each other and they're continually talking, various ways that they're talking, but they are semi stuck to each other by various molecules and the communication pathways often go through those. So the cancerous cell, they'll often lose the ability to stick or they will gain the ability to move. And so they can then disappear from this nicely, carefully sort of orchestrated group and wander off and become a problem. So that's the background to cancer. Okay, and those processes underpin cancerous situations that we see in, in, in all tissues, really. And so what is osteosarcoma? Well, this is a malignant tumour, a cancer of bone cells. As we understand it, it's the most common canine bone tumour. 85% or more of bone tumours are osteosarcomas. Sadly, it's invariably fatal. There may be the rarest of rare cases where this disease can be cured, but almost invariably it's fatal in, in suffering, suffering patients. Mostly middle-aged to older dogs, averages around seven years, give or take some breeds, maybe a little bit older. It has been reported in very young dogs. I've seen it in, in young dogs, very sad, obviously, when it happens at any time, but when young dogs are affected by it, it's, it's tragic. And it's, a most, it's mostly in the bigger dogs, or as we're seeing, maybe not such big, big dogs, but there are, um, it, it, is a, it is a big dog problem. We don't tend to see this in, in toy breeds and small breeds. The breeds that have been reported to be overrepresented, if you look at the literature, would include Rottweilers, Wolfhounds, Great Danes, Retrievers, Irish Setters and Greyhounds. Now, a lot of this literature comes from abroad. Sex predilection, it depends on breed. Males are 
across the board more frequently affected in most in many breeds, certainly most breeds. In the US data, some of this suggests that females are more frequent in things like Great Danes, Rottweilers, and St. Bernards. It is most commonly identified in the legs, okay? And it's the growth region of those bones that are most frequently affected. Remember, the bones grow from top and bottom aspects. And front legs have a preponderance compared to hind legs. We do see non-limb tumours, okay? The sorts of places that we will see those would be in places like the jaw and in the bones of the head. Occasionally, we'll see that in the ribs, occasionally the spine and occasionally the nose, i.e. anywhere that you find bone really, but essentially those are less frequently occurring. And, and some of them become easier or more difficult to treat surgically. So as you can imagine, osteosarcoma of the nose and the skull bones becomes a very challenging disease to treat with any surgical approach. We very rarely see in soft tissues, so the soft tissues of the body that are not not made of bone normal, normally. We can see these in, in the spleen, occasionally in mammary glands and occasionally in kidneys. Others others have been reported, but those are pretty rare. It's, some, it's sort of suggested that prognosis varies with sight and perhaps the ones in the mandible and the skull are less aggressive. Now, that's the irony, isn't it, that they are sometimes much more difficult to remove. It depends on where they are in the jaw, the mandible being the jaw, the lower jaw and the skull, you know, unless you're in a very accessible and, and redundant place in the skull, it can be quite challenging to repair that. And as we said, that, that small dogs have, have far less incidence of osteosarcoma across the board, regardless of whether it's in their legs or not. So why does it develop? What, 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 do, we, what do we think we know about this disease at the moment? So there's some suggestion that there are physical factors being heavy or overweight, the growth rates, the idea that these giant breeds are affected is something to do or suspected perhaps to be due to growth rate. The impact of perhaps previous bone trauma, inflammation, implants. There's been an interesting recent study looking at an increased incidence of dogs suffering with osteosarcoma that have had TPLO surgeries performed. That's a, a surgery to try and correct damage that's occurred to, with cruciate injury or cruciate ligaments in the hind limb. So that's quite an interesting study. Not really explored that one too much at the minute, but it has quite a lot of implications because some of these dogs that suffer with osteosarcoma also suffer with cruciate disease. And so this may be quite an important point to have raised in this, the, the, the research that have done it in terms of what choices might be best to make in, in those breeds. And this is the thing about research is so many interesting questions that have potential great impact for, for, the, for the quality of lives of the animals that they're, they're studied in. Exposure to radiation is something that's also been reported, both experimental radiation and therapeutic. The idea that over time you might have radiation for perhaps soft tissue sarcoma or mast cell tumour, for example, that at that site perhaps there is an increased risk over time of developing an osteosarcoma. Genetic factors, the holy grail, various genes, loads of genes have been looked into. There are lots in the literature, there's a few here. Things like the P53 gene, so this is a, an important tumour-related gene. And here it means that, that if, you, if mutations in this, you can't regulate a lot of the genes that may end up then developing cancer. RB signals and P10 tumour suppressor gene pathways have also been reported. So things that, that as we said, these situations where they our cells are either gaining the ability to do something or they're losing the ability to listen. Heritability, so this is an interesting thing and there's clearly genetics in heritability, that's what it's all about. But do we know enough about that? No, but what we know is in the breeds that are predisposed, there is a heritable component or they all live in the same place, which we know they don't. So there is a heritable component as we think in, in these bigger dogs. So why does osteosarc develop? So going to these molecular factors, so things that are involved in internal communication. So the MET proto-oncogene, ERB2, IGF1. So IGF1 is a, an inflammatory marker. Or it's, a, it's a cytokine that has it tells cells to do different things in different situations. And this mTOR um, rapamycin receptor 
it all of these have been implicated in in, in development of um, of cancer or osteosarc. The molecular factors are disruptive of the local environment. Why why is that important? Well, the bone's pretty hard stuff, isn't it? So if you if you're a cancer of bone and you you turn up and you're the nastiest cancer in the world, but you can't squeeze your way out of a bony matrix, you've had it. And this is the issue is, you know, all of these processes have to be optimal in order for that cell, that cancer cell to survive. So, so the cancer cells will also gain the ability to digest away the local environment with these matrix metall metalloproteases as well as other things. So they can eat away the structural tissue that's around it. The ability to, 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 to live longer, this telomerase activity. And then things that control gene activation. Okay, there's very these sort of little RNA, micro RNA molecules that have been identified that are involved in regulating tumor progression. So all of these play different roles. We see this is complicated. This isn't just one thing. And therefore, these are challenging areas to try and manage because the the one thing that controls all of it is is very difficult to even perceive that that exists. But it just shows you that this is a complicated process. We said 15 to 25 of these events needed in solid tumours. And this gives you an idea of how, how many of these have been. And these are things that have been identified, let alone the ones that haven't been looked at yet. So what about the history of dogs with osteosarc? How do they present? Often they'll present with a swelling, with a swelling that seems to be sort of discordant, perhaps with some recent trauma that might be quite mild and a, and a large mass develops over the site. The pain associated with it can be, can be fairly severe. And some of these dogs will have had a bone tumour there for a while and some trauma, mild trauma leads to some major event in the tumour that leads it to bleed and, and, and crack. Occasionally dogs will present with a pathological fracture, so the fracture of that site has occurred because the, the, the tumour has led to such instability of the normal bone that, that it is no longer viable. Remember these are big dogs and these are legs and you can't do much if, if you, you're about to fracture your leg, it, it's quite an obvious thing. And, and presenting with a fracture can be you know, it's a fairly disastrous way to arrive. Not many of these do occur, but, but there's enough. And there are limited, as I said, limited, limited reports of tumours spontaneously regressing. I've never seen any. It would be nice if I had, but um, I haven't. And then you start to question the diagnosis in these cases. So what about what about where they are? So distance spread is very common. Often we'll see this at the time of diagnosis. Interestingly, spread occurs from tumours to multiple in multiple ways. We tend to see osteosarcoma. It can be in distant sites without being, and this is the same as true of a number of sarcomas. They can turn up in distant sites without being in the local lymph node. And osteosarcoma is another one of those that can be in the local lymph node without it being very big. So these can be quite misleading. And the sentinel lymph nodes, as we often call them, even if they're not big, you need to make sure as part of give me that investigative process that you make sure that the, the, the chest is not involved because you can't rule it out if the lymph node is small. We do see spread to other sites. We can see it to bones themselves and we can see it to skin. One of the things that is a, a, a huge frustration is that the idea that the presence of the primary tumour has some inhibitory effect on spread that may be occurring, particularly in the lung, maybe elsewhere, but certainly in the lung. And the idea being then is even if you have screened the chest with as fine a detailed method as you can, i.e. that would be CT, the most widely available would be CT, high resolution CT, that'll pick up METs probably a couple of millimetres in diameter. You take the primary away, even in situations where the chest has seemed, has seemed to be screen negative, they may end up within a short period of time, large metastatic presence. And so it, there is this odd situation where primary tumours seem to inhibit the growth of, of the spread. And that can be really sad when animals have gone through a process when it's been looked like they're stage negative, which is, and we'll come on to ways that we can stage these things better. Um, because it's relatively crude at the end of the day, because you're not looking at molecular level investigations in chest imaging. These are, you know, these are gross disease. So yeah, this can be very disappointing. And one of the things is that the, 
that we can see um, these tumors in other sites, they can be quite misleading in terms of how big they are. Okay, as you said, so they're obvious in the limbs because if it's a sore leg, most dogs will, will be slightly lame. But in other bones, it can be difficult to know, you know, if you've got nasal, early nasal tumors, tumors of the the brain case, for example, or, or some aspects of the spinal bones, unless these are interfering with the tissues underneath, they're often not very obvious. And one of the big deals is things like rib tumors. So rib tumors can be very much the tip of the iceberg. And so you can often have a very small lump on a rib. But when you image that dog, the, the internal aspects of that tumor are enormous. And so, again, it's important that we, we understand that, that, that what looks like a fairly innocuous lump can be quite, quite serious and severe. So as we said, what what is necessary for the for the bone cancer to actually survive? The, the tumor starts eating away at that normal bone. It sticks down its version of bone, which is abnormal. The matrix, matrix being the, the solid stuff that, that enables your bone to be hard. And all of that's not normal stuff. It's it's the tumor version. So it's very fragile, it's poorly organized. And that's why you've got the pain and the discomfort associated with it because it isn't in a, in a normal way. And so you end up with a situation where by definition, the tumor being present will be painful. And that's a massive aspect that we need to focus on. The tumor rarely crosses a joint space. Okay, so if you've got a disease crossing a joint space in a limb, it's probably not gonna be a tumor very rarely. So what happens to the dogs? These dogs are often ill. You know, people think, well, why are they so ill? They've only got a tumor in their leg. Well, cancer is a, is a, is a horrible metabolic disease. And so the tumor will elaborate lots of cytokines and stuff that will make you feel unwell, will make you lose weight. So these dogs are not just dogs with what would be the same as a, as a bit of a fracture. These are very much dogs that are not very well. And the cancer is driving that. We can also see this odd disease where, um, Dogs with diseases in uh, lumps in their chest, so this can be large mets from a primary tumour. They can have lameness in other legs that aren't necessarily directly related to tumour spread there, but tumour spread to the chest gives you this odd marriage disease. This is a, a sort of a, a very an interesting process, but it can be very frustrating because, again, increases the morbidity. So diagnosis can be tricky because of the presence of tumour in, in amongst a, a lot of dead bone tissue. So these tumours die off a lot. So we can have a lot of necrotic tissue inside that. So biopsies can be quite challenging to get a definitive diagnosis. Radiography is very good. So good quality radiographs will often, with the features that are identifiable, it can give you a strong suspicion of. So we must make sure that we, we get the chest in as well so that we know whether they're spread. So what we can see, we can see changes in the amounts of bone. We can see changes to the surface of the bone. Often there's a lot of swelling and the surface of the bone, the periosteum is, is lifted up. This is, is, a, is a clap, it's Codman's triangle that it's called. In some cases, the changes can be subtle. And this is where if you're taking your dog to the vets, they can get the opinion of a, um, of a teleradiology specialist. And that, that can count for a huge amount when there's, there's some degree of suspicion, um, very easy to do. But we need to be careful about not diagnosing osteosarcoma when, it's, when it isn't osteosarcoma. So the radiographs alone, we can't always rely on those. So this is a relatively subtle osteosarcoma in the top part of a dog's front leg bone, the humerus there. We can see that this sort of little, you probably can't see my um, thing wobbling around, but you can see just under the joint there, we've got some sort of, the bone looks a little moth-eaten. This is a bit more obvious. This is the lower part of the femur, just above the stifle joint. This is a horrible and classic looking bone tumor. So CT, of two dogs' legs here, stifle again an elbow. And this is CT of a chest with a, a rib tumor. So on the right side of that picture, you can see that there's all that sort of light gray stuff pushing into the lung, which should be black. And that's a tip of the iceberg tumor. So you're not seeing most of that tumor on the outside. It's hardly anything on the outside there. So getting a diagnosis, it does require a biopsy, and tissue biopsies are standard of care. Now, as we said, we need to be very careful because there's a lot of dead tissue in the tumour. And so you just often, and I get, I've had this working with orthopaedic specialists, getting biopsies, these things, they're frustrated. Sometimes they, they doesn't matter, even with CT guidance, they've had necrotic bone and nothing suspicious for tumour. So there can be problems with that. Now, I, I tend to di get di direct vets to do fine needle aspirates in these situations because 
two things. The bone over the top of the, the top of the bone is often quite soft, so it's easy to put a needle in. And you're looking for various characteristics. You're looking for cancerous characteristics of the cells plus the stuff that gets deposited. This matrix, this osteoid, it stains pink under the microscope. If you've got a load of cancerous cells that look like they're bone cells, even if you don't get a lot of those and you get osteoid, a lot of that matrix, it's almost puffing mnemonic for osteosarc. Um, it's not gold standard, but it is very strongly suspicious of, and I tend to do that as the first time. The, one of the main reasons I'll often do that is that in, in a very, very few, well, very few, in, in a few cases of bone biopsies, you will get a pathologic fracture. So if you're putting your dog through a biopsy, we have to be aware that small proportion may end up with a fracture at the tumor site when these burnt caught, because the biopsy is taken with these sort of jam sheety needles, these sort of metal needles taking a core around. Some of them will, will fracture, not many, but they do. And therefore that can be, again, it does direct treatment down certain routes if you've got a fractured bone tumor site. And this gives you an idea, it's horrible, it looks horrible, these sort of bloody vacuoles, this cavity, and you can imagine if you put your needle in the wrong place there, you're just going to get a load of mush. And so we have to be very careful about making sure we get that diagnosis right. And this is why we want the chest at the time. So if we look at this chest here, this is a dog's chest, the heart's in the middle, the spine is at the top, the ribs are the white bones coming down in the middle. And if we, it's easier to have a little bit of a, a distant view at this. If you lean back from the screen and you look, you will see round pale grey dots all through the chest and that spread of, of bone cancer is classic these what we call cannonball metastases these single lumps so how do we how do you determine a prognosis well it's bad news from the start there's nothing really that good it's just not quite as bad young dogs worst prognosis you might imagine processes are going to do this in a young dog means that their abilities to stop cancer are not going to be very good at all we said skull tumours are less aggressive than in the limbs, but they can be problematic. Um, and and soft tissue tumours are, are less aggressive. So some of those may be curable, but often they're, they're not identified very easily, so the spleen being one of those particularly. But if dogs are presenting with spread at the time of diagnosis, their survival time is very short, several months alone. Lung mets are the worst ones, and they give you an idea that this has been very generalised, this disease, for a while. Alkaline phosphatase and blood tests can often help in terms of the idea of prognosis, but but again, it's not it's not a it's not a hundred percent specific for osteosarc. So it's it's been reported in the literature, but I think prognosis wise, very little is going to give you a significant difference in prognosis of the things that we understand it. As I said, this is bad news, but worse news if you've got some other factors going on. So some of the things that might help are specifics in terms of the staining of the tumours themselves for certain molecules that may give you an idea of that they're more aggressive or less aggressive, but it's still a fatal disease. The things that are, that are, that are becoming quite interesting are looking at blood tests, particularly to look for molecular evidence of spread. And so under those circumstances, having a better idea of how much better some of these dogs will do, and perhaps some of the more involved in invasive treatments, it might be that these molecular approaches to understanding whether you've got spread or not will be the ways that these can be directed better in the future. So the bottom two there, things like circulating exosomes and circulating tumour cells in the bloodstream, that's the, that is the holy grail to identify metastatic spread or the evidence of these cells in the circulation. Challenges with that though, or bits of cells, are that dead cells might circulate. So we have those, those processes of identifying cells have to be very, very accurate because you don't want to accidentally say that you've got spread when all you've got is dead cells floating around the, the blood system that haven't yet been pulled out by the spleen or the liver. Nevertheless, there are a number of areas of investigation as you might expect. What about the outcome? Sadly, most going to be dead within a year. And that's the awful bit of this. And so this is regardless of treatment. Most will be euthanized due to the condition, whether that's directly at the time or as a result of complications. And often this is due to the presence of, of spread of metastatic disease. So for me, 
this is a quality of life improvement disease because we can't cure it. Now, that quality of life might be sustained remission, but nevertheless, we're trying to improve that dog's quality of life. And one of my big concerns here is the pain associated with the tumour. And so controlling pain is the big deal for me in dogs that have got the tumour that remains in place. And that's often overlooked. So what are the priorities for treatment? We've obviously got to deal with the primary tumour and pain relief therein. Removal or control of metastasis and freedom from disease recurrence. That's that's what treatment has to really think about in, in this disease. And sadly, the latter of those is very poorly achieved. And what treatments are available? So we've got surgery to get rid of the primary tumour that can be full amputation versus limb sparing procedures. We've then got radiotherapy, chemotherapy and some of these immunotherapies. So what about reducing chances of recurrence? We've got things like trying to take the, the, the spread away. We've got chemotherapy and immunotherapies. So what about if we use an, an additional therapy? So if, we, if a dog's undergone amputation, for example, what about the timing of introducing chemotherapy? Remember the standard of care for this disease is surgery plus follow-up chemotherapy. And the NICE study that came out relatively recently that looked at the group, the small, relatively small group for the for the numbers that we were looking at in terms of the number of days. But the sooner the treatment was introduced after amputation, the better the outcome. And the survival time for dogs that would be started on chemo within five days was much longer than those that were after five days. There's often this idea with the surgeons, there's a debate between the surgeons and the medics and oncologists about, well, having done surgery, when do you want chemotherapy? That, well, we don't want chemotherapy too, too quick because we don't want it to delay our wound healing or anything. But as we can see here, within five days is a better time or the, the benefits of that surgery are realised better if you've got chemotherapy introduced soon. So amputation is the most commonly performed treatment in the UK, but it isn't sufficient on its own to delay recurrence in most cases. It addresses the local disease. There's also the challenges over whether that seems like a good idea, and we'll come to one of the things that we've done in a minute to, to talk about that. Pre-op considerations, if you have severe orthopedic or limiting orthopedic or neurological disease, this can be problematic, full amputation anyway. And so in terms of um, the surgical procedure itself, it, the, the, the interesting thing that, that people have looked at is that there, there is no benefit for survival developing infection at the amputation site. Now, we'll come on to limb salvage or limb sparing surgeries. There's some evidence that infection at the surgical site can improve the outcomes, and we don't really see that in amputation sites, so sort of more soft tissue infections. So limb sparing surgery is where you can, if you've got bad orthopedic disease or neurological disease and you can't risk not having that limb there. But obviously that these animals aren't using it at the time because they're mostly three legged when they come in because of the pain. And so there's a, it's not a lot in the literature. It's increasing, but it's still not a huge number. But in some cases, a very good return to function. Um, and it doesn't really matter how much is sort of taken away. It's still very good. But it, but it doesn't work for, if you've got a large osteosarc, then usually we're looking at sort of less than half of the limb, otherwise it's, it's too great a removal. But, but adjunct chemotherapy is still required because you've, you've not fixed anything more than you would have done by doing a full amputation. Better in the lower limb tumours, uh, the, the things like shoulder, hip and elbow, less well, more complicated really. Um, and the idea being is that these dogs are back to function sooner and the limitations of the other legs not working are, are not realised. But half, maybe up to half of them get infections. And, and as we know, what well, we think that actually that might be a good thing. Not that that's good for the surgeons because they get a bit grumpy if they've ended up with infections. I think they've not done a good job. Um, but clearly these are things that can, that can happen. But nevertheless, um, it can be a, bit be a better outcome. There are various ways of putting that bone back together or limb back together various bone animals you get bits of bone from companies or from the animals themselves you can look at metal prostheses and there's 3d printed ways of doing this now lots of lots of ways of doing it not easy surgery and, and not 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 cheap surgery either as a recent study looking at just basically shortening one of the legs it was a an animal that i think was an owner owner osteosarc and the limb was made six centimeters shorter so whilst limb sparing was sort of done, they basically just cut some out of the other leg and left it sort of wobbling along. Apparently that was a, 
a good outcome for the dog. I think that that's it's sort of salvage, but um, anyway, it's another way of, of looking at this. Now, interestingly, the dogs that have had limb sparing surgery, so those dogs, so what, what happens to those if they get it back? Do they then, you know, is it right? Sorry, there's curtains for you. You can't have another surgery. Now, clearly, in some of them, the reasons for not amputating in the first place are not that the other three legs are not going to cope because there's a recent study looking at if these dogs have recurrence and they have an amputation as the other dogs would have had without limb sparing in the first place there is a a better overall survival time so the idea being you've got a stage you take a bit of the leg fix the put back what was what's gone and, and patch it up and then at some point you might have to take the whole leg off and in doing that stage process, the outcomes seem to be better. So it's quite interesting. Small study, but just because you've had limb salvage, that that may confer maybe a long term advantage. And I'm not saying this needs to be a stage process, but it's an interesting set of early data. In non limb tumours, taking part of the bone away can carry a reasonably good outcome, certainly functionality wise so without taking the tumor away people well what, what if we do that so if we look at trying to kill the tumor in situ i.e we kill it in amongst the normal bones so there are looking people have looked at using specific radiotherapy techniques really um things like getting in and lifting the the, the, the surgical uh, lifting the tumor out of the um out of the, the bone and then putting it back in again with a with a, a bone plate to try and zap that. Is everyone can still hear me? My earphones have just got a little bit funny. Um, uh, and that that's uh, unsurprising. You've got quite a high complication rate. I don't know that that's very, very popular. But now radiotherapy is moving on very rapidly in the veterinary field and things like what's called stereotactic radiotherapy. So you've got a very targeted radiotherapy approach where this is computer driven and a dose is, can be delivered very, very vocally into the tumour. So this may offer a very, very, very effective treatment, very effective palliative treatment, certainly, but it may be with various sensitizers. This might be a way that, that this disease might be quite well dealt with at the local level. Radiotherapy for tumours themselves is a treatment, but what that has a role in doing, just standard conventional radiotherapy, is to it's more of an analgesia rather than um, anything else. So on its own, normal external beam radiotherapy is a is a treatment for for pain rather than killing the tumour. Um, there are intravenous radioactive compounds which don't really we don't really use those very much. It's all very experimental. People have looked at photodynamic therapy. So for cats' noses and superficial tumours, photodynamic therapy is very good. You you rub a cream on or you'll give some kind of agent orally or intravenously, and this will then accumulate within a, a, the tumour tissue and you'll shine a certain wavelength of light at it and it blasts the cells apart. That can be very effective, but not in osteosarcoma, unsurprisingly. It's too big and too deep. Chemotherapy is a is a very important treatment for osteosarc as an adjunct to taking away or having taken away the primary tumour. Okay, it, it is it is well established to improve survival times in affected dogs and they tend to tolerate it very well. It doesn't work on its own. You can't treat this tumour just with chemotherapy. It's too it just doesn't respond very well to chemotherapy on its own, not when it's in a large lump. The classic tumour treatments would these days historically have been cisplatin nowadays we're looking at things like carboplatin or doxorubicin we tend to use some carboplatin in the clinics i've worked in similar outcomes um if we're using chemotherapy um similarly not not many are, are alive at two years as we know and these are the ones that we're pairing up with with surgery people have looked at metronomic chemotherapy trying to use lower doses more frequently that tend to target blood supply to tumour rather than tumour themselves. Two drugs that we tend to use for this and other tumours would be things like cyclophosphamide and domestine. Unfortunately, the studies in osteosarc have shown no great effect at all and, and, a, and, a, and a much potentially higher rate of side effects. Newer drugs, things like tyrosine kinase inhibitors, people are using a lot more of those now for other tumours than when they were originally introduced, but unfortunately they don't on their own seem to have a good effect against osteosarc. Um, when it's 
there's a, a couple of experimental studies looking at losartan, which is a um, a drug similar to Symmetra for renal disease. Combining that with TKIs, there may be some evidence for improving outcome in dogs with metastatic disease. And adding in doxorubicin, amylaride to doxorubicin, which helps to try and acidify or change the pH of the tumours, rather, that has some idea that that might improve the effect of, of the chemotherapy. But those are both relatively experimental at the moment, but may come online at some point. We're talking about immunotherapies. What about drugs that stimulate the immune system? So one thing that's been mooted about for several decades, actually, would be this MPTPE. It's basically a, something that stimulates macrophages. OK, it's a, um, a liposomal product. And anyway, it, it gets macrophages to do a better job. Macrophages are those cells that eat things very effectively. And so there's some evidence that this may be a value in treating metastatic osteocyte. There's some um, approval for use in humans in, in the state. So it's interesting because it has been around as, a, as an experimental tool for a while. So this may come online at some point in the future. So what about molecular treatments? That's the idea, isn't it? Switch all these things off, as we've talked about. People have try, tried a number of things. As we said, IGF-1 is a is an inflammatory molecule that tries to tell cells what to do and expand and blocking that didn't really alter survival rates. Metallic met, met, MMPs, metalloprotease inhibitors, that hasn't really looked at or hasn't really been realized. As we said, these MMPs need to be present to digest the, the, the tissue around, the matrix around these tumors in order to enable them to disappear off. Stopping that doesn't really seem to work, unfortunately, unfortunately. CBD oil. So people often ask about CBD oil. There's some interesting in vitro data on the anti-cancer effect of CBD oil, regardless of its anti-inflammatory effects. And so no great clinical trials as yet, but interesting ideas that may be coming out of this. Watch this space, I suppose, with that one. Vaccines. Vaccines have been tried for osteosarcoma. There's been a number available or available, a number in trials. And that's the the, the, that is one of those holy grails, we said, it, the cancer avoids the immune system. So trying to get the immune system to kill the cancer that it's missed is the holy grail. We know that this is something for cervical cancer in humans has made a massive improvement in managing and perhaps eradicating cervical cancer. So trials and investigations have been going on for a while. There's a listeria, which is a bacterial based osteocyte vaccine developed in in well, for humans, but then repurposed in the States. And that's a big study that had gone on. And so that had a very good outcome. There's been a paper relatively recently looking at complications and a number of dogs had complications with the bacteria, although this bacteria was supposedly inactivated. We saw there's been a number of dogs that have developed abscesses and septic joints and pneumonia. And also listeria is a bad bug for people. Not saying that this is a, you know, we, this should be gotten rid of, but nevertheless, there are these things, you know, we, we, we work these things out over time, don't we, with new new approaches. So there, there are some concerns over that, that vaccine, but it has been very effective, I think, in the dogs that have, that have received it. There's another um, publication recently about taking bits of the tumour itself and developing a, a vaccine within the individual and then putting that back in. And perhaps that's been associated with some good outcomes. Some of the dogs are living for a couple of years. And there are other trials with vaccines that are going to be going on. And those may be the quite exciting things to be involved with. They may not come to anything, a lot of them, but is but it is an effective way of going forwards with 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 treating this disease in the right at the right point. So what about spread? How do we combat spread? There's a number of things now all publications now looking at removal of the, the spread itself, challenging surgery, usually up to three nodules in the lungs are thought to be access that are thought to be accessible and that has been associated with with outcome, particularly in, in these cases where you've got lameness in other joints, taking the spread out can improve all of that. Removing bone mets is very challenging and it's been done in a few cases, but poor outcomes really. Inhale drugs to try and treat the chest mets because these chest mets are so important. Various people have looked over the years. Experimental use of inhaled chemotherapies have been tried. Few have really shown significant improvements, but there's no systemic side effects. So, you know, they're safer in that regard. There's some interesting stuff about interleukin 15 recently, where perhaps up to, up to half of these dogs had 
a good a good benefit and it's a terrible drug when it's given in it, systemically but inhaled it seems to be better but something that we need to be aware of and these things may come through some of them you know, don't reach realization because they're often too expensive or or not widely available people have looked at irradiating lungs big deal but limited side effects and so it, I, I don't think this is going to catch on to be honest it's limited in terms of where you can do it costs would be prohibitive and outcomes are, are not sufficiently good to say that it would be great people have looked at trying stimulating the immune system we looked at this a little while ago with a little study it's of limited value um, but anyway as we said the immune system is the thing if we're going to try and get a holy grail what we target Pain is what we need to control, though. If the primary remains, for whatever reason, we have to control the pain. And that's why that primary not being there is, is the, 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 the way that I think this disease is best treated. As we said, all this stuff that goes wrong with the bone is where the pain comes from. Conventional medications, non steroidals very effective. Opiates, morphine-derived drugs, very effective. Steroids, occasionally. Paracetamol, gabapentin, amitriptyline. These, these combination pain relief protocols are the way that we tend to go with these because that's the best way to treat it you you can hit it from multiple sites acupuncture can be very effective and we know cbd oil is increasingly used in pain clinics that for some of the specialists i work with have been using this for a while now radiotherapy can be very effective as we said radiotherapy for the tumors it doesn't really kill the tumor itself so much but it does provide some fairly effective pain relief for several months often two treatments maybe a few more Radiosensitizing drugs can help in terms of trying to get um, targeted radiotherapy out of sight. You put, put these drugs in, they, they accumulate in the bone and you give radiotherapy and it can make it a bit more effective. So again, that may be effective for some uh, locations of spread. Bisphosphonates, we, we use these quite a lot now and these are drugs that are developed to try and sort of in for osteoporosis and things so they, they accumulate into bone and they, they prevent bone turning over and so they they particularly get into tumor cells and and that's that's important and so it, it prevents the tumor turning over and getting any bigger we we use a number of these um permidronate and ledronate would be the two that we probably use most there are some studies looking at some side effects of cilantronate and permidronate so we need to be careful but um they can be very very effective as as adjunctive pain relief drugs on their own they're not effective as a treatment for osteosarc but they're great to help with with pain relief so we've reached the end of this bit of preamble and so let's summarize then our understanding is relatively limited our ability to treat the disease is relatively limited our ability to improve quality of life in dogs with osteosarc acceptable at best, and we can't cure this disease. So we need more research, don't we? So that leads us on to some of the stuff that we've been trying to do over the years, really, with different breeds and, and different questions. So what, do, what options do we have for reducing the impact of this disease? So one would be looking at what is there anything in the management of these dogs that can be changed to change outcome and if we look at and understand more about the genetics of the disease in these breeds could we breed it out so the first of those would be the low-hanging fruit if you can change the way you're managing your dog great the holy grail has got to be the genes the genes are hard to try and change as we've seen this is complicated it's genes and environment so Changing the genes is not easy, changing the environment is. And so the low hanging fruit has always got to be the thing that we're trying to target first. Short and long games with this, clearly. And so that's the, hence the pictures here. We've got a hair, short, gets there quick. That's the low hanging fruit. And then your tortoise is the one that comes reliably in the background, slow and short. That's where the genetics come in. So do we have to cure the disease? Yes or no? Yes is our knee jerk. But what about no? Does no have a role? Well, if we look at this as a treatment goal, so our disease is a, is a short term disease. This you get your osteosarc, most of you are going to be dead in a year. So that's an acute disease. You don't survive. How's about with changes in management and tweaking some aspects of how these genes work? We might turn this into a chronic disease. So it's a bit like arthritis. A bit annoying, but it's not going to spread and it's going to grow very slowly. And in a dog that might be 10, 
that develops this as a disease, its kidneys might give up or its heart might give up before the cancer kills it. So there are different ways of looking at how we can manage this disease. And it certainly, it opens up opportunities where we wouldn't necessarily have seen them to try and change outcomes. Remember, we're changing the outcome, which is quality of life. Good quality of life, if that's a year and a half, two years, three years, if we've improved it with managing it, changing it from six months to nine months in some of these dogs with aggressive disease, that may be okay. Oh, yeah, you probably, I'm not sure people are old enough to know um, Hale and Pace's management, but that's a picture of the management group. Hence, managing these dogs. So what questions have we asked? So we, we've looked at what about the influence of breed? We've tried to look at some aspects of management factors, a bit about diet and treatment options. OK, these are the things that we've started doing, what we've done for a little while. So the influence of breed. So clearly, which breeds are involved and which ones are the ones that we need to sort of target and help? So the, this came about our first study looked at Rottweilers in the UK. This was a student, Shireen, that, that had a dog who died of this and said, you know, is there something we can do to try and figure out a bit more about it? And we said, yeah, why not? Let's have a go. And that's where all of this came from. OK, and we wanted to just check that it wasn't just her dog and a couple of her friends that, that might have had a rotty with osteosarc. And so we had a look, had a chat to some of the UK histopath labs about Rottweilers, and they were one of the biggest, you know, sadly, one of the biggest breeds affected. Um, and it was it was very stark at that point. And it. it it seemed at that point quite an even distribution between males and females and front to back legs seemed to be similar. Now, this is something that may be different in, in different areas, but nevertheless, the rotties were a big yes. And we look at the spread here. So this is the, the early days. This is quite a while ago now, looking at the breeds that are involved. So Rottweilers, crossbreeds, obviously crossbreeds. The so Rottweilers, the red arrow is there and we're going around clockwise. So we've got a decent chunk of crossbreeds. There's a lot of crossbreeds. Big load of Labradors, but a load of Labradors. Greyhounds on there, German Shepherds, flat coats, Dobermans, Boxers, Golden Retrievers, Lurchers, German short tailed Pointers, Border Collies, and the rest. There's no Wolfhounds, there's no Deerhounds. Wow, where are they? Where's the Great Danes? Now, the thing we have to remember here, this is a the rest. These are stuck in amongst the rest here. We, we looked at just a, a spread of, of breeds. Now, we have to look at this in a slightly different way, which is relative to the number of samples submitted by that breed or from that breed how many as a proportion are osteosarcoma and so back in at this point when we looked there were loads of osteosarcs submitted okay 13 percent from labradors but 11 percent were from rottweilers and when you look at how many came in from labradors in general so how many samples came to the lab from labradors there was over sixteen thousand samples of which 140 were Labradors. Rottweilers, there was only just under 6,000, yet there were 94 of those. So less than 1% of the Labrador submissions were osteosarc, whereas 2% were Rottweilers. So clearly, Rottweilers were more commonly affected by osteosarc than Labradors. But if we looked at numbers, we say, oh, blimey, it's much more common than the Labrador. It's not. They're a more common breed. So what roll forwards to this month? Hey, hot off the press, this. That's a TARDIS. It goes forwards and backwards in time. Be nice, isn't it? Current data, courtesy of VPG, the histology um, group based down in um, Exeter, excellent histology group. This is what we've got just recently. So we've sort of been looking at this for a little while, actually, but look at this. So greyhounds, the top of the shop now, 5% of all submissions from greyhounds. Rottweilers up at just under 5%. It's a bit like sort of the charts, isn't it? Not a chart you want to be top of. Deerhounds at 4%, Great Danes and Wolfhounds pushing to 3%, Ridgebacks a couple of percent, and Dobermans just under 2 Compared with Cocker Spaniels, Boxers, Border Collies, and Labradors, all less than 1%. So this is verifying which breeds do we need to help here. All of those in the top list. There's a horrible disease. Those dogs are all going to die from it. So what about management factors? What, what have we tried to look at here? So the Rottweiler study that we did a few while, a few years ago looked at this, trying to see, can we find any of that low hanging fruit? Easy, tasty. So at the time, a lot, most of the literature was from Rottweilers in the USA. And so we decided we'd look through that and see, well, what did we want to look at in terms of what was established as risk factor? So 
the breed, obviously, genetics, height, weight, sex, neutering agent, neutering and various other things, exercise level and all of that. So we put together a fairly sizable questionnaire to try and gather information and saw what we had a look at what we got. This is the front part of the questionnaire. So what did we want to answer? We wanted to answer, does the gender alter the risk of developing osteosarcoma? Because there was this stuff about males versus females. Does neutering increase the risk of developing osteosarcoma? There's a lot of anecdote about that. Does the timing of neutering influence the risk? Does the history of orthopaedic disease influence the risk? This is Shireen at some of the places that she went to all over the country with, with trying to promote this project. Um, and amazing job she did. And we swabbed all these dogs that were in the study. OK, and so we had a, we've got a load now. So the initial study was just under 750 completed questionnaires, a lot of dead Rottweilers, sadly. Um, now the database contains about 1600 rottweilers and we've got swabs from most of those similarly we've worked with the wolfhound group and we've got just under 600 wolfhounds in the study so this is an invaluable database of, of of genetics of these dogs so what did we find males had a higher risk than developing osteosarc than females neutering increases the risk of developing osteosarc the earlier the rottweiler is neutered the higher the risk and there is some relationship between orthopedic with orthopedic disease. This is the graph of what we saw with um, the neutering. And as we can see, the, uh, the age goes along at the bottom. And as the, uh, the, the, the predicted risk at the, at the side. So earlier, so the age is your, if you're six months and you're neutered, you've got a massive risk of developing osteosarc in this cohort. So that raises some concerns about pushing for neutering in, in some of these big dogs. We don't know. We've not got similar data yet from all the other breeds, but this is this is enough to question some of the aspects of early neutering recommendations. What didn't seem to make a difference was body weight and condition and the way these dogs were exercised and vaccination status. So we also tried to look at greyhounds. This is before I got this data on how frequent it was in greyhounds, largely because of historic histopath data and that anecdotally in these retired racing greyhounds, of which we see a lot of the lovely dogs, that there was concerns over it being common. So we've done two, we've got two things from greyhounds at the minute. One was looking at comparative epidemiology and retired rating greyhounds, and also an ongoing study looking at a sort of a mortality study to try and understand more about whether what, how this affects the breed. So in the, the, the retired racing greyhounds, it didn't look like any leg was any more likely, but there were plenty in this study. There were some that had developed orthopedic injuries, but it didn't seem like that affected how early this occurred or whether it occurred. They were about the same age, so it didn't, you know, that they'd raced and they'd had trauma. It didn't suggest necessarily that they were going to get this disease earlier than the averages in the literature. But neutered males were younger than females at getting osteosarc. The, the the aspect about racing is quite emotive and, and it does it, it is difficult to, to often get these studies done the agenda isn't to stop greyhound racing it's to understand more about why these dogs when they retire often get cancer off bone cancer and so i think this is a study we want to expand there was a few it's not a lot and i think with more dogs in this study we'll understand more about the subtleties of the injuries and 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 how that may affect the the outcome the current study which is a mortality mortality study and looking at management of the dogs at the same time we've tried to look at pedigree versus retired racing greyhounds and having spoken to the the breed health coordinator for the pedigree greyhounds that was a disease that they weren't really particularly bothered about whereas you speak to any of the retired racing greyhound um sort of senior folks they're it's a they're terrified of it and so wow that's interesting these are genetically very similar but there's a very different opinion of what sort of diseases they get so we've been running this sadly for three years now the retired racing greyhounds we've got 251 again i spoke to lizzie who's been coordinating this one of my students we've got three pedigree greyhounds and we've we've done all we can other than go around to these people's houses and sit them down on the sofa and get them to fill out the questionnaire we need more pedigree greyhounds to understand more about this. This is a breed who are now top of the list for developing osteosarc, and we've only got three of the ones that we really need. We need the ones that supposedly don't get it to understand more about why. So that's yeah, that's where that one is. But what about some more low-hanging fruit? What about diet? Low-hanging fruit. Well, you know, 
this was something that we looked at with Rock Wilders a couple of years ago. We redistributed the, the initial survey focusing mainly on diet, nearly 600 responses. Um, a decent number that had got osteosarc over 10%. Unsurprisingly, you know, these Rottweilers, when you do a Rottweiler survey, a load of them have had osteosarc. It's just tragic. We looked at the impact of dry diets, home cooked diets, raw diets, and then an other group for those people that fed all sorts. But we didn't find any significant difference. Okay, so there's no benefits or drawbacks of, of diets under these circumstances. Perhaps the, the raw feeding might be newer for some dogs or they you know the, we didn't drill down to subtle aspects of two months on this and three months on that but overall the diet didn't seem to influence outcome so what about the dogs themselves so we we've, we've come up you know, certainly with the rottweilers and, and in some bits of the literature males are more frequently presented with this disease we don't really know why so this on the right, those of you that are molecular biochemists will have spotted, obviously, that's the androgen receptor, which is the thing that converts, confers maleness in response to male hormones. On the left is, is sort of the maleness of the male. This is the incredible Hulk. So essentially, the androgen receptor is involved in sort of male tendency. And so we looked at whether or not, because it was more prevalent in males, could this have a role to play? So it has been implicated in the development of, of osteosar, but we don't understand why. So we looked at changes or differences in this receptor and whether or not that might influence the development of osteosarcoma. So we were trying to look at, was it the receptors that were different in the, or the dogs that were developing osteosarc compared to the ones that didn't? So a relatively simple study. And we had a, another, again, the, this questionnaire was, was rolled out. And um, in this study, we had about just over 420 and again, we've got DNA swabs from all of these. Obviously, we looked at the how how variable this receptor was. It changes in length um, is what we were looking for, and it had it didn't have any effect actually. So the ones that got the disease got the disease, and the ones that didn't didn't have um, didn't have any significant difference. But interestingly, this in amongst all of this neutering again was flagged up as influencing the development of the disease. So coming to the end now, but what what something that's really intrigued me and fascinated me over the years is the the willingness to undertake certain treatments for certain dogs in all sorts of diseases not just bone cancer and this has always worried me because of the pain when we're presented with dogs that have got osteosarc they're very rarely walking comfortably on four legs mostly they're walking on three legs and it's just excruciating to see much more excruciating to have obviously so the, the thing for me was that the standard of care is amputation and chemotherapy. And we, we ran quite a number of um, breed symposia at the vet school a while back. And, and a lot of the, the people there were very reluctant to have their giant breeds legs amputated and understandably so. This is, I don't have one of the, anybody that we've worked with with, dog with three legs picture, but this was a, a three-legged wolf and I found on the internet, which looks pretty sturdy, bless him. Um, and it's quite interesting how much he towers above the other dog, he's fantastic. I like all things. Um, and so we looked at the treatment and the impact of treatment. And what we wanted to do was look at the owner perceptions. And we looked at a cohort of owners that had had dogs with osteosarc and a cohort of owners that didn't, the dogs that hadn't had osteosarc. So it's, it was quite unusual to find that the, the ones that hadn't that were giant breed owners because so sadly so many people have experienced it. So we looked at the owner's opinions of osteosarc treatments in large breed dogs. And so the primary hypothesis that you wanted to test was that, the, that these large breeds or giant breeds will retain a good quality of life after amputation. OK, as judged by their owners, not by the vets or not by someone else that saw them in the park. They looked all right, but by the owners themselves. OK, because they're the ones that this this is really important for. And it was so we used the wolfhounds, deerhounds, rottweilers and greyhounds. For this. So over 150 responses, responses, predominantly wolfhounds and rottweilers, less deerhounds and greyhounds, but still some in there. Most people had selected chemo and amputation, some had selected amputation alone and some had selected chemo alone and some had done all sorts of bits and pieces, but not amputation. So we can see here out of that group, most had not gone for amputation. Now, if we looked at this data and we thought, well, how long do they survive on in our little study compared to the literature? Amputation alone, about 183 days. Chemotherapy alone, perhaps 164 days. Amputation and chemotherapy, just over a year, what you might expect. So it sort of validated the, the fact that this is a treatment that we think improves the survival times. OK, and bearing in mind, these are giant breeds that have had 
amputation and chemotherapy, they've not gone within three months. These dogs have lasted longer than chemotherapy when amputation on its own and much longer when chemotherapy has been added in, which sort of almost validated our study. But nevertheless, this is the graph. I've condensed this down a bit. So this is the, the, only, the graph of owner perceptions and dogs tolerance to amputation. And so if we look at this, these were like at scales. They're pretty well validated scales for assessment. So they were well tolerated, very well tolerated or, you know, OK. There was some poorly, no very poorly tolerated. And there's a couple of poorly tolerated. And that's the big worry, because actually, if it's neutral or, or above, that's OK. It's not made the situation worse. Now, interestingly, the poorly tolerated. Both of those. It was poorly tolerated because it was bandage irritation, nothing to do with the ambulation, which was was really nice to see that the, it was a complication post-op about how it was the skin was managed, really, not that they couldn't get around. And so from this study, it suggested that most of the, all these treatments were well received. 70 plus percent of owners in those would recommend them again and were comfortable with, with the treatment decision they made. And so these dogs had a good quality of life and particularly that had undergone amputation. So it helps to say, don't, don't be so negative about this as an option because the dogs that have had it, those dogs that are giving you the information have done well. Therefore, it's OK. And the big deal, the pain that they experience that we can't quite get rid of is gone. They don't have their limb. And as they ambulate well and live longer, it's quite a good advert. So there's a tick for that one. So finishing off with genetic studies. So there's our holy grail in the corner. And so we've been working with a number of breeds for several years, looking at epidemiology data, the questionnaires, swabs for the gene analysis of the dogs themselves that are affected and unaffected. And also we've we've gathered over the years paired tumour and non-tumorous bone samples to undertake various studies. And this has been a, a sort of labour of love really over the last few years. It's been challenging since I've moved away from the vet school full time to, to keep with a lot of these projects, but it's still very much in the forefront of our minds. So our current tumour database, we've got about 20 of these tumours, OK, which are priceless. And we plan at some point soon to try and recommence sample acquisition. And we have a new website that's coming online called caninesarcomagroup.org. And that's where lots of information will be posted. Here's nice little genetics pictures and genes and some um, bits of coding there. So we've got a number of papers. There's a couple of papers here looking at the genes and the features of the tumours themselves. So this is moving to our holy ground. This is moving to the genes that we can turn off or turn on to try and change stuff, maybe change our suddenly fatal to chronic disease that's leapfrogged by a kidney failure, that sort of thing. I can provide people with any of these papers if they want them. So this was using tumour impaired normal bone. The, the important thing about tumour impaired normal bone is you might find loads of stuff in the tumour, but it might be in the normal bone as well. Therefore, it's not a feature of the tumour. And we've got to try and look at what is special about this tumour, that it's a tumour rather than normal bone. And so here's a, the, one of the, the figures from the, the paper looking at differences between normal tumor, uh, normal bone and tumorous bone. And the, if we look here, the graphs, the bar graphs, not so important about what they are, but what we've got there is the black is the normal and the gray is the tumor. And we can see there's quite a lot of differences here. We identify quite a few of these that are potential areas of investigation, whether they might be turning the tumor on, turning the tumor off, making the tumor disappear from its matrix or or making the tumour less able to, to, to die in the face of various markers. So these are all sites of, of potential targeting. This is the next paper, because the thing you've got to understand is if you if you're identifying genes that are supposedly higher, you've got to understand what that gene makes. Does that actually get made or is this just a, a tissue phenomenon and it doesn't actually do anything? You might have found a gene that seems to be too highly presented, but it might not actually have any function. And then you're pointless trying to look at that. So this is the next paper that looked at some of those genes that we'd identified, the product of those genes, does it, do you, can you find it in the tissue? And the answer was in a lot of these, yes. So what's the significance? So the, the important bit here is that the things that we identified were involved in processes, this wind activation. So that's to do with immune signaling, regeneration and tumour cell growth, biosynthesis of heme, glucose transport. All of those are potential targets for trying to starve these cells of whatever 
and kill the cancers. And so this, this enables us to understand more about the tumours themselves and gives us therapeutic opportunities, which is part of that treatment plan and potential holy grail. So what next? Funding to facilitate, facilitate ongoing research. Putative drug targets, that's the big deal, isn't it? That's what we want. We want to know how to kill this tumour, kill the disease. So that's always going to be me as a clinician, research clinician. That's what I want. I want to kill this tumour. I want someone that comes into the clinic for me with a dog with osteocyte. I want them to take that pot of pills and they go away. And in six months, the dog's running around and the tumour's gone. Maybe we'll never get there, but that's what we want. We want a drug that's that effective. And also, I need to tell those people that may not, we may not have that drug, but how can I give them a better idea of what to expect so that their selection of treatment, their willingness to undergo treatment is, is audited effectively, getting an idea of how bad is this and how long are they likely to survive. That's a holy grail is what we're after. So that's a, to finish there. Um, this is the people that over the years have been involved in our osteosart projects, Nigel, Catherine and Malcolm, very much the, the, the Nigel and Catherine, the two geneticists that I work with, oncologists and, and Malcolm, um, a cardiologist who, who's been interested in Wolfhounds for years as well. And then a list of the students that have worked with us over the years. Some of them are still working in the area. That's not me on the right there, by the way. I've not got grey hair. Well, not that grey anyway. And then a whole trance of acknowledgements. And I need to give special thanks to Di McCann, who started this off back in well, 2014. Di, sadly, is no longer with us. But it was my conversation with Di that started everything with the Rottweiler group and everything that's followed on from there. It's, it's a special lady. Um, and then all of the people, you know who you are. Um, you're all fantastic. And we're, we're eternally grateful for the effort you put in in trying to get people involved in these studies for the right reasons and, and to try and at some point make a big difference to the outcomes of the dogs that, we, that we're trying to treat. And thanks for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions. Mark, thank you so much. That was an incredibly in-depth um, presentation and a really, really interesting and useful look um, at this really, really emotive area and issue. I am going to um, ask you a few questions that we had in, in advance. Um, yeah. We do have the Q&A facility as well. It's not actually working if you're on a web browser, um, but do... Um, do please try to um, ask the questions there. Otherwise, we'll pick them up afterwards. Um, do you want me to stop sharing my screen? I'll try and do that. If everybody's back on, or shall I leave the screen on? I don't mind. Yeah, no problem. So, OK. Um, so you did touch upon this in your presentation, um, but I think it's a, it's a really big concern to, to anybody that has um, an interest or a potential concern in this area. What are the early signs and symptoms? So just like recapping, what are the early signs and symptoms of considering and what is the general prognosis when this is initially discovered? Yeah, it's a good question. I think this is one of the biggest problems is I'll see Rottweilers who walk in with an osteosarc and you think, well, it looks like their ear is more sore than their leg. And so the challenge with these breeds is often they're very stoic and, and owners know their dogs. So any subtle lameness, it needs a, it needs investigating. And I've had owners come in and they, they're really kicking themselves that a, a subtle lameness that they thought might be orthopedic disease. Because, again, these are all big dogs. And so they're, well, it's probably a bit of OCD of the elbow or I'm not an orthopedic surgeon. And so, you know, whatever they get. But owners will say, well, it could be just that. And that's, yeah, it's probably that. That's the Metacan for a few months. That's the clincher. At the time you first identify a lame, a, an air, a, a new lameness for me in a giant breed is a, is the time to be proactive because you take them to the vets and if there's a bit of pain below the joint, anything subtle, that's your time. Don't leave an early lameness unchecked. That if I was going to say anything, that would be my recommendation because this is a disease that by the time we often see this. It, it's still incurable, but the morbidity associated with the tumours themselves, the likelihood of spread at the time of diagnosis, the chances of having a, another six or 12 months will go up if we can pick this up early. And in, in the future, it may be these early tumour identifiers that 
will respond better to some of the newer drugs that we get. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, and you've you've spoken a lot this evening about breeds and prevalence in certain breeds um, and obviously size. But I didn't know if there was anything else you wanted to just recap really on uh, what breeds are more prone to this disease and, and how big a factor size is in that. Yeah, I, I th again, I, I, that's one of the things that we're trying to work out, really, because the the another we've got on our on the list so there's there's no there aren't any small dogs unfortunately on this list so size has got to play a role growth rate may play a role you know but the, these bigger dogs grow for longer so i'm not sure that growth rate's massively important but size you don't get this in a teacup chihuahua and they're quite a lot smaller than a wolfhound so i think it is the size we don't know why but it is not just the giant dogs you know greyhounds are big but they're not wolfhounds then and so there is something about the genes in these dogs. We've that another group that I've had from the, the lab that are that are that are overrepresented as I've not put them on the list of lurches. There's a load of lurches involved. So lurches are sight hound types. And so there's stuff in here that really pushes us into genetics as well as size. But nevertheless, I think it is these big dogs that we're seeing. And the the you know, ridgebacks aren't really related to any of the nora dobermans nora rottweilers it's just there's there's features of the genes i think in these dogs unfortunately perfect thank you um and you have covered genetics quite um you you really did go in depth on the genetics and and the role and where we are now and um, but obviously for breeders this is a really really big concern and nobody wants to kind of um, you know, any breeder would want to avoid this. So is there anything that breeders can do to breed healthier offspring or is there any way to avoid this? And obviously, considering that discussion you had early on about genetics. Yeah, I think this is where honest involvement in studies is really important. And so breeders, people that have been in these breeds for long periods of time, and we've, we've worked with a lot of people that have and they're fantastically knowledgeable. They'll know dogs going back 50 Jenny well, not 50 but but loads of years that oh so and so had a dog that had this it is that information that is invaluable and the, the pedigree analysis of these dogs to try and look at common features now the flip side of this is that you try and breed out osteosarc and they all get dilated cardiomyopathy before they're six months of age so we've always got to be very careful about complex genetics but lines that seem to be more frequently affected trying not to use those or breeding with unaffected dogs that you know the stuff that the kennel club are involved with this is the the perfect opportunity to try and understand more about the heritability and the honesty of it and i think the biggest challenge is the stigma associated with being the affected owner or the affected breeder they're also is so common that everyone's in this together and i think having people try and engage with a a large scale pedigree analysis to see if there is anything that can be pulled out of that, which people have probably done over the years that I'm not aware of, is, is where we need to get to. Because there's not going to be a gene that we identify. It's complicated. So if we can identify patterns and trends of how these, these the, the, the unaffected, less affected cohorts arise, then we'll probably be able to make a bigger impact. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to move over to the, the chat question. So um, Elizabeth has asked, um, do standard preventative treatments such as worming tablets have an influence on the development of the cancer? From the stuff that we've looked at in the questionnaire, because we've got that in the questionnaire, it's not ever come up as being significant. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, I also, we've had quite, I know you have covered this, um, you did mention it as well, but we have had quite a few questions about neutering and the impact of neutering and the risks of neutering. Do you have yeah. any sort of final remarks or breed specific? Yeah. Um, well, I think kind of... it's hard. Yeah, yeah, it's hard. And I think I think there is a role. I don't know what it is. And that was the whole point of looking at the angiogen receptors. But, but I think it's risky to early neuter giant breed dogs. Now, there's all sorts of flippant comments about entire giant breeds and all of the risks associated with it. But in, on a serious note, if this is we we think that there is an influence of some aspect of 
of being male and being being entire that protects you rather than being male and being neutered and so it i think that the overwhelming thoughts from anyone that's in the field of osteosarc and other cancers is that that this is a cancer that that is is more frequently i encountered in in early neutered dogs thank you for covering that um just a quite specific question for you um are there any new options for and i'm going to apologize now because i'm going to pronounce this wrong and you're going to have to correct me um metronomic treatment or alternative treatments uh for example yeah. ben ben yeah i mean nothing that's evidence-based and i think the trouble with with all of these things is it's fine but it's to do with evidence and the evidence that people gather and people put out is at different levels. And somebody saying, hey, this works, you should use this. It, it may not. And therefore, if you've then foregone the possibility of going down a more conventional route, you might have lost some time. The, the challenge with that, the, the, the sensible person in the audience would say, well, you just told us that you're rubbish at diagnosing it, you're rubbish at treating it, then you're rubbish at getting rid of it. So I've just told you that all the conventional stuff we can use is a bit rubbish. But but it is it is based on fairly extensive exploration as to which of these treatments could be effective. So no, I, I'm afraid I don't have any robust data on anything alternative at the minute. The only thing that I would say, and I know it's a little heretical sometimes amongst sort of the, the veterinary community, is that the um, the role of CBD, I mean, cannabinoids have been very well established as, you know, the role in inflammation and cancer over the years. But there's now some some interesting in vitro data on cannabinoids and what they can do at a molecular level in bone cancer cells. And so if we're looking at alternatives, and I suppose that still does remain an alternative therapy until it's licensed. And I know companies are looking at doing things like that. But that would be an interesting area um, of alternative therapy. I've had a couple of owners who've had dogs with other cancers that have been on CBD oil. And the challenge with the CBD oil is who makes it and where you get it from and, and how, how reliable that source is. But nevertheless, that have had dogs that seem to be doing a lot better than I would have anticipated. That's you know, totally not I've just said about good evidence. That's not very good evidence. But, but there's, there's, it's an interesting area. And that's one that I would look to explore if I were um an owner the only challenge is how much that might interfere with conventional therapies but it is a an area of interesting development should we say thank you um a question from Stephen: um are all tumors found on bones bound to be osteosarcoma or can they have another etiology yeah no they aren't and then probably you know 80 85 percent maybe are osteosar but you'll get other things the tumors that occur but anything that's in the bone so sort of chondrosarcs fibrosarcs you get hemangiosarcs various things you can get um sort of tumors of the the stuff that's in the middle of the bone so no it's they're not all um they're not all osteosarcs and they don't all present like osteosarcs as well um which is why that diagnosis is very important because what you don't want to do is is treat a very low grade or sometimes benign bone tumor that can be sort of more of a cyst as, a, as an osteosarc because that's totally unnecessary to know that they're, they're not all they're not all osteosarcs it's just more commonly osteosarc and do you believe that osteosarcoma is becoming more common and if so why do you feel like there are more cases that you see of osteosarcoma no, I'm not sure that we see more cases. No, I just see, I just know that we don't see cases getting any better with osteosarcoma when we see them. So I'm not sure that it's an increasing um, incidence, and that's something that we can, we know, we're part of our work with the breed groups to, to look into these sorts of things. But I'm not sure that it's more frequent. I just think that it's no better treated. Okay. And I'm going to ask you one more question. And then I have had a few questions, which hopefully I can address about kind of how do we get involved in research and, you know, how do we receive the webinar and um, further information? So just one more question to come to. Um, 
You mentioned earlier about injuries and the connection. So has there been any research, and I apologise if, if you've kind of covered this already, but any final thoughts? Um, has there been any research investigating a connection between bone um, injuries and subsequent osteosarcoma at the site of the injury and how significant those injuries are? Yeah, I think from what we've looked at with the, the Rottweilers, it was sort of very generic and it didn't seem to be the severity of the injury made a difference. And that might mean that actually the how reliable that is, is is not so so robust. But I think one of the things that's quite interesting is the data that's come out of this TPLO study, that clearly that's a fair injury when you've cut a bone and put a plate on it, um, that they've mm -hmm. seen an increased incidence, incidence of osteosarc in those. So I'm not sure that there's any great robust relationship between the severity of the injury and the development of a tumour. But I think it is um, it, it is acknowledged that, that it does have a role. And that comes back to sort of the discussions around you know, why do tumours develop in terms of inflammation um, and, and things along those lines. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we are nearly at half past eight. So I want to say thank you to you again um, for being with us this evening. We definitely want to continue the conversation with you and hope to be able to offer um, more opportunities to kind of discuss this really, really important issue in future with the Kennel Club. Um, we are going to make this recording available on our YouTube page. Um, so we do have a YouTube page that covers all of our webinars. Um, and if you follow the links through the Kennel Club and we will provide that information to you um, following the webinar this evening. Um, in terms of research, every breed has a breed health and conservation plan, and I'm going to use this as an opportunity to really plug the breed health and conservation plans. We include really important research like Mark's research and the papers. Um, if you email health at the Kennel Club, um, if you want to put any further questions to Mark or you want information on any papers or research, we'd be more than happy to get that to you. Um, so hopefully we have covered everything and um, please do keep up to date with the Kennel Club webinars. We are going to add more as we move through the year and we are going to develop a plan for next year. Um, so if you do have any further questions, as I said, please come to health at the kennelclub.org.uk. And thank you again, Mark. Um, it's been a pleasure to be with you this evening. Thanks. Thank you. Hopefully it's been helpful. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.